Kalispera to our friends in Athens, Kalimera to our uh, friends and audience in the United States. Welcome to another series of uh, virtual lectures, an institution uh, organized by CYA during the pandemic uh, in order to keep us in touch, uh, connected with our extended uh, CYA family. Uh, I am here today in my new role as uh, executive chair of the board of trustees of CYA, having passed last July the uh, baton of uh, the CYA presidency to a very distinguished colleague, Theoni Skurta. Uh, Theoni uh, is a person of uh, remarkable dedication and um, tireless commitment and a long experience uh, in education and at CYA, where she has been for 10 years, and also in other uh, positions of responsibility. Um, under her leadership, I'm sure CYA will move even higher. Uh, today's guest speaker is uh, uh, Professor John Caravas, a long-standing member of the CYA faculty, a professor of history and archaeology, and John is a characteristic example of the talent we are very fortunate to have at CYA. His vast knowledge of Hellenistic and Roman history, provincial archaeology, and ancient warfare has enriched our academic uh, environment and uh, has also kept uh, many, many, many students uh, very happy. Uh, John is a, is a great speaker and he has a very uh, strong following among our students. Uh, his subject will be the daily life on a Byzantine frontier the Scythian dimension. Uh, now, he will be assisted by a discussant, uh, another CYA professor, Nikos Tsivikis, uh, an, an expert on Byzantine archaeology and art history. Uh, he, Nikos will guide him, will guide us through the enlightening discussion that will emerge after the talk, I hope. Professor Tsivikis' unwavering commitment to academic excellence is typical, again, of the high standards that we hold dear at CYA. I want to thank Nikos and I want to thank, of course, John for accepting our invitation to be part of CYA's virtual lecture series. As we go into this uh, lecture today, I encourage you to embrace the knowledge and the insights that um, that await you. Please be reminded that the session will be recorded, so anybody who doesn't want to be recorded should switch off their cameras. Um, this will be saved uh, for future use in our archives. So thank you for being part of, the, uh, of our commitment to knowledge, and it is an honor to have you all with us today in this, uh, in this very interesting lecture. Nico, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, Mr. Philoctopoulos for uh, this introduction. And uh, uh, I'm very happy. I'm, 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 I'm pleased and honored to, to coordinate our discussion uh, tonight or today. Uh, so, um, as uh, Mr. Philoctopoulos said, uh, Calimera and Calispera, respectively, to the two sides of the Atlantic. Um, I'm here to uh, introduce uh, the, the, the talk by John Caravas um, on, 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 on uh, a subject that I'm very interested in, and I'm very looking forward to hear uh, about his work um, uh, in the Danube, in the Danube, the Lower Danube and the Frontier. Um, first of all, let me give you some uh, information uh, administ of uh, administrative, uh, as uh, I will be. I will try to coordinate the whole thing. So before we start, um, 
you should know that throughout the discussion, uh, you can all submit uh, uh, questions uh, that uh, or uh, uh, comments that um, uh, you would like us to go through and discuss later on using the chat feature uh, that you can find at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. And as soon as uh, John Caravas concludes his presentation, uh, we will get to as many questions as, as possible at that uh, moment. Uh, so I don't want to, to uh, tire us and, and uh, delay much more. I know uh, I see a lot of people who are waiting for John. Uh, I know also that uh, some of uh, our students uh, are have joined as uh, it was, um, uh, especially in, in my class, it was a perfect timing because we were uh, discussing the Danube frontier this week, uh, this past week. So before um, any long do, I introduce uh, John with his lecture, Daily Life on a Byzantine Frontier, the Scythian Dimension. John, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Nikomu, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Much, much appreciated. Uh, Mr. Phil, thank you so much for the kind introduction and more importantly for the very kind words. And may I also throw a big thank you and a shout out to Vasily Simopoulos, who arranged all of this lecture. Vasily Mou, this is a great opportunity for me to be able to tell people what I was up to for about 12 years of my life, of my life, as I get to introduce them to the site that I excavated between 2008 and 2020, which is called Mary's. May I also welcome you all and thank you for being in tonight's presentation. And may I also convey my apologies for the little bit of a hiccup last week where I had to last minute cancel the lecture, but here I am, so let's get straight over to it. First of all, I would like to point out, if possible, that I will, just to like help, let me just try and get this because for some reason, there you go. So what I'll do in order to help the flow of the narrative is to start with a very brief history of the site throughout the ages. I will continue with a brief history of the excavations, at least between 2008 and 2015. But my major focus will be on the last three seasons that we managed to excavate at Halmiris before the onset of COVID, in which, in addition, of course, to the major finds, the evidence, I'm going to speak about the material culture that can give us some primary observations and equally some glimpses of aspects of daily life on a Roman frontier, which incidentally has not been particularly explored, the Scythian frontier, at least in comparison to anything we encounter in Britain or other parts of continental Europe. So the site in question is known as Halmiris. Palmyris is dedicated, or sorry, situated near the Danube Delta in close proximity to the modern settlement of Murigoy. Its importance, to be honest, lied back in the day in its location. Palmyris was at the very confluence point between the Danube River and the Black Sea coast, and therefore in a very commanding position to be able to control and to monitor any sort of activity, military or otherwise, either in and out of the Danube, but more importantly, up and down the Thracian seaboard. As such, it is not surprising to see that Halmiris has a relatively long and distinguished tradition of occupation throughout the ages, starting in the 5th century as a local, a native Gettodation fortified settlement. In Roman parlance, we refer to this as an opitum, later transitioning into a Greek emporium the best way to describe this would be as a trading post or a trading station, most likely under the jurisdiction of the major Greek colony and urban center of Istria, which is located about an hour and a half just south of it. And it's important to note that Istria itself, and chances are Halmeris, was an original colony that came from settlers from Miletus. It is, however, during the Roman period when we start seeing new elements being added, and by which time Halmiris definitely sees a great change, evolution, and development within its progress. I guess the first thing would have to do with the addition of a fortification adjacent to the civilian settlement that, according to the graphic evidence, was set up in 102 AD, this time by a detachment 
of the two legions that were stationed in the near vicinity, one being the Prima Italica and the other one being the Undecima, the 11th Claudia. It is worth noting that once the fort was actually constituted, the Prima Italica would stay as its original garrison, a detachment of it, roughly 600 men in size. And later, as time progressed, it was supplanted first by the 5th Macedonica and then by the Prima, the first, in fact, Scythica. Second addition that we have is, again, corollary or simultaneously to the uh, civilian settlement in the fort, we have the settlement of or the emergence of a settlement that is dedicated to veterans of the Roman fleet, evidently suggesting that in addition to its civilian and also military occupation, we now have a major naval installation at the site. Next major milestone has to do with Amiris's integration with the other Roman fortifications that are located in the province, which in turn are interconnected to every single Roman fortification on the frontier that will take you through the Danube, through the Rhine, to end up essentially all the way up in the area of modern France. In many respects, we are at the end of the line. We are pretty much the last Roman and later Byzantine fortification you would encounter within continental Europe. Next major stage, and when we have major interventions on the fort, comes during the Tetrarchic period, roughly around the 298, 99 maybe, of the Common Era, in which we had the reconstruction of the fort to give it a very recognizable shape and size that would pretty much carry it through the entire remainder of its occupation. If you're wondering why, in fact, we have this very irregular, trapezoidal-like sort of shape, it is not a question of military necessity. It is simply the result of constant flooding by the Danube that back in the day used to flow, or its course was, just to the immediate north of where you see the yellow bow and as it tends to develop. It is, however, the late Byzantine or the late Roman and Byzantine period between the 4th and the 7th century in which Halmiris truly reaches the height or the peak of its achievement. Halmiris is in fact mentioned in every single itinerary that is contemporary to the times, and it's also mentioned in the narratives of most of the important sources during this period. Within these sources and narratives, the two that I would like to highlight have to do with a very interesting story that Philostorius in his ecclesiastical history actually relates, which by the way, has nothing technically to do with the military installations there. He talks about the story of Eonomius, who used to be the Bishop of Physicus. He was by command of the Emperor Theodosius banished and exiled to Halmeris in 363, at a time when, though, the Danube froze, the Goths crossed the river, completely destroyed Halmeris, and therefore, at the very least, the lucky bastard, he was able to avoid exile to Halmeris. If you're wondering what happened to him, unfortunately, he was now exiled straight into Mauritania, which is modern-day Morocco. The other two sources that are, in fact, are much more indicative of the real, let's say, renaissance or revolution that's transpiring at Halmeris happened to be Hierocles, who does include it within the 10 biggest and most important cities in the wider region. To be honest, in the company of places like Istria, like Tomis, like Calatis, major urban centers on the Thracian seaboard, that is no mean feat indeed. And last but not least, a specific mention, a paragraph, that we have within the works of Procopius writing in the reign of Justinian, who claims that we had the establishment of an independent bishopric, but also specifically mentions the reconstitution, reconstruction, I guess, of Halmiris this time as a frurion, suggesting that the earlier phases of destruction had now, of course, been reconstructed. When it comes over to the occupation, it is, let's say, or this period of peak was a relatively short-lived one. That's because throughout the 6th and importantly the 7th century, we have continuous trans-border invasions. The two usual suspects or culprits happen to be first the Slavars and then, so the Slavs and then the Avars, which eventually led to the complete abandonment, not only of the fort, 
not only of the harbor, but also of the civilian settlement. As a last concluding remark to this, I would say that about 300 years later, the Byzantines would come to reoccupy the territory that did not include Halmeris. By that point in time, continuous sedimentation, alluvial deposits had already pushed the Danube River course about one mile to our north, and more importantly, the Black Sea coast to a minimum of 12, uh, sorry, 20 miles over to the east. So therefore, the one thing that made Hamiris important, its location, has now been essentially nullified. So the site, Halmiris, uh, has been a relatively well-known quantity since at least the 19th century, first through the works of Polonique, a French traveler who was able to see the first remains, and later by preliminary surveys that were done by the professor, by a professor at the University of Bucharest by the name of Tochilescu. If you look over at this slide and to the left-hand side, that actually happens to be an aerial photograph that was taken by the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, in 1941. And to some extent, it actually served as the basis for the stereo restitution that Alexandru Stefan did for us in 1980, right before the investigations are about to start. So technically, Halmiris has been the subject of systematic investigation since 1981 under the auspices of the Romanian Ministry of Culture, of the Institute of Archaeology in Bucharest, and under the supervision of my dear and unfortunately recently departed colleague, Professor Mikhail Zatariade. Most of the focus or the emphasis has been towards the north, and in particular, the northwest section of the fort. It did yield a number of very important buildings, therefore, once again, enhancing, let's say, the topography, the configuration, the purpose and function of how Roman forts or early Byzantine forts like worked at the time. Very like, you know, uh, as examples, I will mention the existence of the Western Gate, the Western Gate, part of which has been partially reconstructed. It is actually the main entrance into the fort and it's the one where the Roman road that begins, the frontier road, that begins all the way up in France essentially ends. Two further things that I should be mentioning about the Western Gate is the existence of what is essentially an underground corridor that linked the Western Gate over to the Northern one to facilitate the quick movement of troops whenever, of course, necessary. And secondarily, the existence of what we refer to as a, in Roman terms, Clavicolo, a clavicle. The idea of this is that should the enemy breach the outer gate, they would essentially be pinned down in what is a semicircular area and therefore be showered with enfilading fire by the defenders. For those of you who have actually visited the site of ancient Messini, and in particular the Arcadian Gate, it is entirely or a very similar situation albeit the one in Messini is, of course, much grander in both scope and in size. Moving on, this is the location of our northern bastions. And for those of you who are not in the know, a bastion is actually a artillery platform. It looks straight over to the Danube. You'll notice that in this case, it follows a U-shaped configuration, which is rather typical of late Roman, early Byzantine military architecture at the time. If you're wondering why do we have an extended, a factor, platform, and more importantly, the highlighted little wall right smack in the middle, it is again because of excessive flooding. So I guess the Romans and the Byzantines at some time learned their lessons and they decided to, of course, try and counter it. Right next to it is what we consider to be one of the most bizarre and surprising buildings we actually encounter. And I say this, or I dare say this, because it is the only one that we have encountered in any of the fortifications that happen to be in the near vicinity. It's a gate. It is a gate that evidently opens up straight to the harbor. But it is a very important gate. It is a very elaborate gate. It is a relatively lavish gate. And I can assure you, it definitely cost them a penny when they actually built it. We know that the man responsible or like it was done 
under the reign of Theodosius. Chances are, it is the entrance that any sort of like incoming traffic from the Black Sea coast would, after disembarking on the uh, on, at the harbor, basically enter into the uh, site of Halmiris. Uh, the problem is that at some point, they realized that it was also one of the most pregnable points in the fortifications of, or the walls of the fortifications, and therefore it only had a threshold or longevity of 60 years. So the Romans decided that instead of just having an elaborate gate that looks beautiful, the best thing to do is just take it down, dismantle it, use the rubble alongside with backfill to once again reconstitute the fortification. This is one of my favorite sites that I actually happened to excavate. It is a bathhouse. It is not the bathhouse for the legionaries. It is not the bathhouse for anyone who resides in Almiris. It is actually the commander's private bathhouse that is dated from the 4th and continued to exist until the 6th century. Things that I really love about this is that when we excavated it, it was an almost perfect state of preservation from the vestibule to the three, in fact, different chambers that you usually encounter in Roman bathhouses, cold room, the hot room, and of course the tepid room in between. But what is really interesting is that the hippocostum, the furnaces that actually like would regulate the room temperature, are still intact. So literally the only thing that you would need in order to have these fully operational would just be bring water from any sort of source. Back in the day, I hope you realize that the water would come straight over to the Danube, once again through an underwater uh, supply system. Last but certainly not least, and admittedly the one thing that really put our site onto the map, was a discovery, again entirely surprisingly, because we do not encounter it in any other fortification in the wider area, of what was an actual Christian basilica. We do know that this was built or commissioned by Constantine the Great in 326 and therefore would constitute it as one of the earliest of its kind that we encounter anywhere in the Eastern Mediterranean. The excavation of the Basilica, let me just say, took the overall period of 10 years, where once of course we were able to find or to excavate all of the interior, we stumbled on to surprise number two, which in this case was the existence of an underground crypt, which, and as I'm going through the slides, after a lot, in fact, of work, revealed the crypt with two ledges on each and every side, some absolutely exquisite uh, wall paintings, which those in the know, that's way beyond my pay grade, told me that they were probably made by workshops that came straight over to Kasabinopol, and where bottom line, the inscription mentioned that this was the burial place of two of the earliest martyrs in the region in the form of St. Astion and St. Epictet. To kind of put the crowning achievement on this, and as fair warning, I'm about to show you remains of humans. These were the remains of St. Astion and last but not least of St. Epictet. Something that evidently right now pretty much added over to our overall street cred as an actual excavation. Now, to take you away to remove this rather macabre and kind of morbid little theme, let me in fact tell you what we were up to between 2016 and 2019, and therefore start focusing more on what this lecture is essentially all about. So in 2015, we already took the decision that our next step, the next area we would like to investigate Yes, we call it Area E because it's in the east, and as we all know, archaeologists have zero imagination to save their lives. The whole idea of investigating this region would have been not only to see its connection to the already excavated buildings, but also to see its kind of role in the defensive elements that we see in the north and northeast of the fort, including three fortification towers, and last but not least, Given that this area was actually adjacent to where the ancient harbor of Halmeris was most probably located, to see exactly what kind of interaction, what kind of interrelationship we could establish. 
The first three years, actually, were devoted in the excavation of a building that, frankly, we did not expect to find. This is what we call Building E. Again, I repeat, zero imagination. It is a relatively big building that consists of two separate chambers, an antechamber, 710 by 275, and then through, in fact, two different entrances that back in the day were supported by a pier and therefore pillars leading into the inner chamber, which more or less had the exact same size, 710, albeit a little wider at nearly four meters. The excavation of this building, as we in fact went along, the good news was able to give us a very good idea just simply by looking at the construction techniques and material about the relevant dating of this particular chamber. So therefore, starting from the early fourth century, and then I hope you can even see the distinct material that is actually used at every given point, taking us and therefore confirming the narrative of Procopius that talked about the reconstruction of the fort during the time of Justinian's reign. That was the good news. The bad news is that, and I say this like, you know, admittedly, we have no idea as to what this building could have been, because once again, we do not encounter it in any of the forts that we use for reference. The discovery of coins that belonged to the reign of Anastasius all the way up to Justin gave us a hint, you know, a working hypothesis that perhaps this could have been, again, a custom station, so that the minute that any boat comes in from abroad, obviously you have to go, you have to declare the commodities, so on and so forth. The second working hypothesis, the one that I found appealing at the time, was that this perhaps could be the aerarium, which is the treasury. It's the bank. Every single Roman fort actually has one of its kind to make sure that all of the payments go in a place where supposedly they could be protected. But the problem is that the coins themselves constituted only a very small amount of the material culture that we uncovered at the site, as the majority of the finds seem in fact to denote maybe, just maybe, a religious purpose and function you'll see a fraction, in fact, of some of these finds that the one that you see at the top middle, is clearly with a stamp of a cross, the one right next to it, which most likely was used during communion, and perhaps the most impressive one, the one that you see at the bottom left corner, where you can even see the inscription FOS, and then shortened in typical Byzantine script, XY, so therefore light of Christ, FOS Christu. This has pretty much changed our original observation. And then perhaps as an additional working hypothesis, we might be looking at the personal residence of the archbishop that would have been located within the fort of Halmeris. To be honest, this was partly, partly again supported by the existence of or the discovery of several pieces of Crocian stone. Crocian stone, for those not in the know, actually hails from, it's, it, it's a green type of stone, a Greek porphyry, if you will. It hails from Lacedemon in Sparta. It is very expensive. And as such, finding it literally in the middle of nowhere up in Scythia would suggest that this building would have been elaborately adorned and also, of course, dressed up. So the working hypothesis of maybe personal residence to the bishop, sure, why in fact not. The Eastern barracks now, which again occupied a lot of our attention, just to like, you know, speed up the process so I don't bore you with endless in fact confirmation. But over the course of three years and adjacent over to the towers, tower number two and tower number three, we did find what clearly appeared to be barrack blocks. This one, which was tentatively called EB, so Eastern Barrack 1, seems to have had two entrances to make sure that it can actually be used by soldiers that have to, at any given moment, man one or both, in fact, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the towers. The second thing that we noticed is that there was always interconnecting open space that would give you the ability, if you are in one barrack block, to right now start visiting the one just to the south, EB2 was a designation that we gave it, 
leading over to further open space for supplies for storage, and then to the final three, in fact, barrack blocks, EB3, EB5, and adjacent to it, EB4. Frankly, the material culture that came out, so the finds or the discoveries, were relatively low. One thing that we know for certain, after the original observations on these barracks, that they are irregular and very small in size. At best, even the larger ones, like EB1 and EB4, could only accommodate about eight soldiers. In total, at best, accommodating 40 soldiers. So it's important to remember that for a fort that, you know, a few centuries ago was capable of hosting 600 men, which is the usual detachment of a Roman legion, we now believe that during the Byzantine period, this number would have decreased at 80, and this, in fact, at best. What we also see as a kind of pattern was the repurposing of rooms that you would usually associate with the barracks, like places to put your armor and so on and so forth, that are now just used for provisions, for storage, and in some cases I'm about to show you in just a little bit, even as hearts and ovens. What I'm trying to say is that the barracks are already now giving us an indication of the transition between a purely military site just for soldiers with a very particular task in their mind, and right now telling us about how this is gradually turning into a fortified settlement with a skeleton military crew that is just trying to do its very best against what is becoming an increasing threat from across the frontier. We thought that maybe we struck gold when we were eventually able to ascertain that what we thought was a barrack blocks and very small EB3 turned out to be the armamentarium or the arsenal that most likely was used as storage for the entire defensive arrangement in the Northeast. Now, arsenal is a bit of an overstatement because of the weapons, and a lot of weapons actually came out from that, let's just say leave a lot to be desired. This, I guess, and I'm saying this from like the point of view of a Roman military historian, is what would qualify as a Byzantine shield boss, most likely the sixth century. This actually pretty cool because it's again a shield boss with a projectile, a slingshot that was fired and for some reason actually got stuck on the shield boss itself. This is again a very poor excuse for a catapult bolt, in particularly a ballista or a scorpion, which is, I have to say this, a far cry to the kind of craftsmanship, to the kind of like, you know, what we encounter in the Roman period. This, I swear to God, I have been working, excavating on Roman forts since the age of 20. I have never seen a catapult bolt that actually looks like a two-pronged fork. But this, I can assure you, is exactly what it is. And without doubt, my favorite by far, this. This is a helmet. Yes, it is cracked right back in the middle. And if you're wondering how on earth they actually did, yeah, the only thing they had to do is just take one nail, Rack that or whack it straight in, nail it in at the very top, and here, in fact, you go. I guess the nail is a far better proposition than just gluing it together or just holding it together when, in fact, you are going to go to battle. So, if you wonder, in addition, of course, to the overall military purpose, does the armament also show you a relative decline in the equipment of soldiers? Yes, indeed, that is something that we have certainly um, that is something that we have certainly uh, encountered. Than this one. For any Roman, in fact, historian that deals with Roman fortifications, and given its proximity to the tower, the first thing that would you come to your mind is that this is a ramp. So the idea is that somebody or the soldiers would, like, you know, literally drag up and then roll down a piece of artillery to contribute to the firing power that have also been generated where Tower 3 was. At least that's what we thought. But as the excavation again progressed, we started seeing an entirely different repurposing of same room. If you're wondering, this is the kind of room where we found ovens, 
and hearths. Sorry, guys, for some reason, my okay mouse is not playing. Ovens and hearths. We found a plethora of many storage vessels that are, again, of no military importance, from the medium to the small and cute ones, all the way to the very big ones. And God bless them, we even found a clear evidence of what were air vents, the one that you can see right now straight over to make sure that whatever in fact happened in that room, you would always have a way of the air going out. What I'm trying to say is that what would, in a typical Roman fashion back in the day, been a platform for the rolling of artillery has now turned into their kitchen whether it's for soldiers or in fact for civilians that happen to be there, still unknown, it just gives you a very good indication of how things in fact have changed from the glory days of old. Tower three, and I have to admit when I say a nightmare, it was indeed a nightmare, and there's a good reason for this. The thing is that tower three, forwards or after, or what I can tell you is, it was built in the late third century, and then it was completely, in fact, locked up again by rubble and then landfill by the time of the 5th century. Again, it tends to indicate that given the lack or the shortage in manpower, having an excessive number of operating gates made no sense whatsoever. So at the very least, by, by jamming them up, it's the only way to make sure that you can counter any sort of offensive. For what it's worth, Almiris, back in the golden days, had 14 military towers, bastions, so on and so forth. By the time that we hit the Byzantine period, this has only been to two, the western and the northern, that still continue to be in use. At the very least, after we were able to remove all of the collapse, remember the self-made collapse and all of the landfill, we were able to find the typical characteristic, again, uh, like elements that you find within a tower from its entrance, the landing, and then last but not least, to where you have the separation through a wooden ramp leading over to the artillery platform, as opposed to the lower bottom, where obviously this is what they would have used originally for their ammunition. Once again, because Halmiris does have this tendency of just creeping up on us and just like throwing us a curveball of surprise that we never in fact accepted, we found the repurposing or the reuse of what used to be a sarcophagus cover from the cemetery of Halmiris, located about two kilometers away from the fort, in which right now they reused as a pillar for the support of the lower part of the tower. So, <clears throat> some final thoughts, some final observations, in addition to what I already said about the decline in military vigilance, prowess, let alone indeed equipment. One thing that struck us, and this has nothing to do with, or, you know, with the military character or the military nature. The material culture clearly again shows the real true pervasiveness, not only of Greek language, but also of ancient Greek artistic patterns. It is worth stressing here that Halmiris, given its location, is a true crossroads. It's a true melting pot that would find people, populations from different ethnicities, religions, cultures, the list goes on, in which the Greek, proper Greek and Roman element constitutes only a minuscule minority of the overall population. And yet, all through this, the material culture, be it from typical amphoras, or where here you can actually see the alpha and the omega, which again, you know, kind of harks back to Christian, in fact, beliefs, all the way to other inscribed pottery in which Greek is again fully dominant. By the way, here at the very bottom, Maybe, I hope the picture is not that great, but you can even see that it mentions the name of Almiris, the Greek or Grecified version of Halmiris. Incidentally, great thing. So we do know that most likely we are digging a Halmiris, just in case we got it wrong, you know, the first time. This is a very interesting oil lamp, and it's only one of the quite few or quite many that we found that 
despite the fact that the fort technically at the time and with a bishopric is under you know full christian if you will control still you do have some resilient persistent throwbacks into older polytheistic beliefs as we tend to believe that this most likely is a representation of a satyr by the way found in a fifth century context as is this showing you in fact like a vineyard so therefore the collection of grapes which according to the context in which was excavated is again the product of the fifth if not in fact the sixth century speaking of in fact like the pervasiveness of greek it has to do mostly with the language and i repeat technically greek might be the official language but sometimes we are struck by the amount of people who are not Greeks, and yet for them, Greek happens to be the lingua franca. For example, we find a lot of stamps from this particular gentleman, Muslio. Most likely, he owned a pottery workshop, either in, most likely outside of the fort. Muslio is a very common ancient Thracian name, and yet all of the inscriptions are, of course, transcribed in Greek. Second, one of my favorites by far, if you're wondering what on earth are they trying to say here, this is Heracles, Hercules. So just imagine somebody whose native language is not Greek, maybe he doesn't even read or write well in Greek, he hears Heracles, and the best way that he can actually transcribe it, even though it is an actual error, is by using the alpha iota, and therefore pretty much writing it as he tends to hear it. The most spectacular and, dare I say, unique find that we have uncovered al Hamiris comes in the form of a military reference letter. It is datable to the 4th, mid-4th century to be more exact. It is the kind of reference letter that the commander of one fort sends with the soldier who wishes to get transferred to another. So this is a soldier that served at Tomis, just a little bit further down with us, he wants for some reason to be transferred to Hamiris. But what is absolutely unique about this is it's a Roman official document. You'll notice that the names, the name of the soldier is Valerius Constantinus. And all of the terminology that happens to be Latin, like in the third, in fact, line where you see frater, brother, brother in arms, are all transcribed in the Greek language. If you're wondering, this is the obverse. This is, in fact, the reverse that tells us about the story of the soldier. In the second line, it says clearly, legiona. So again, a Roman military term that is now being used again by its Greek transcription. And then a list towards the end about the achievements. I guess it's a kind of like CV for the soldier to merit the transfer over to Hamiris, where each and every of these terms are typical of the ones we encounter in Roman military parlance, but again, I repeat, transcribed in Greek. To the best of my knowledge, this is not only one of the more or the rarest finds that we have, we know about these reference letters, for the love of God, but for the same time, we don't have many evidence that survives, but most importantly, it is the only one in which you tend to encounter this very particular pattern of Latin terms, Greek, in fact, language. Another aspect that I also find relatively uh, interesting has to do with their diet and nutrition. Big shout out to all the lovely people, our forensic archaeologists and anthropologists that came and painstakingly removed all of the remains that we were able to excavate uh, you know, the animal remains throughout the course of these three seasons. And more importantly, because they were super fast in responding and giving us their own preliminary uh, uh, observations. Incidentally, this is in the process now of being, uh, of being published. So therefore, we expect this to come out within the next year or so. So the first thing that they told us is that all of the meal preparation, so the cutting of the steaks and so on, was done outside of the fort. So the only thing that the soldiers or the civilians that are in the fort have to do is just like, you know, throw them into the oven, throw them to the grill, and here you go. For obvious reasons, beef, pork, and sheep seem to be the usual culprits or the usual suspects. 
fish. Well, we are next to the Danube. So the amount of fish remains that we found was again abundant. Birds, storks and pelicans that seem to be in fact in abundance in the area of the Delta. And then the Romans, God bless them, and the Byzantines ate whatever was in between. In usual fashion, we did find carbonized seeds, wheat and barley, which either ways we knew was a standard daily um, staple for all of the soldiers at the time. But again, coming back to what really struck us out of this was the proliferation, the real abundance of small, not big, which would make sense of like, you know, having guard dogs, but of small canine remains. If your question is, did they actually consume dog meat at the time? Thank goodness, no. The forensic anthropologist told me specifically that the Romans and the Byzantines would have small dogs as pets. So once again, showing you that discipline has obviously gone down. To be brutally honest with you, because again, this is beyond my pay grade, I don't know if my forensic anthropologist told me this because they know I'm a dog lover, and I probably would have freaked out if I realized that the Romans and the Byzantines consumed dog meat. But you know what? I'm happy with this explanation, and this is the one, in fact, that I am sticking with. So as a few final concluding remarks, and I do hope I have not bored you or tired you, uh, one thing I should say that despite, of course, the original surprises that came every now and then, the objectives that we set out in 2016 were more or less, in fact, achieved. The thing that I find very interesting is that Palmyris is one of the very few forts in the area that is being actively excavated. Secondarily, it's one of the even fewer forts that, and this was the personal decision of my dear colleague Mikhail Zachariade and I, that we decided to go for a horizontal extension, so therefore giving us a glimpse of how a Byzantine fort would have looked and operated during the time, of course, of its existence. It is clear that in comparison to earlier times, and more importantly, even to earlier forts, Palmyris seems to be bucking the trend by essentially trying to provide a balance between the military and the civilian, in fact, sector. As I said earlier, it is better, in fact, not to think of this, the site, as a purely military one, but rather as a fortified civilian settlement with a few troops thrown into the equation for the obvious reason. So it is, in fact, the interaction between the civilian and the military elements that will hopefully be the uh, topic, the premise of our future research on the site, as we right now are focusing on the full publication of all of the finds, past and indeed up to 2019, when in fact we have the chance. So thank you very much. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, John. It uh, thank you for this uh, amazing and very very interesting uh, you, talk. Uh, uh, we saw all these great finds, and <laughs> and um, they are. I mean, for well, at least for some of us, they are quite breathtaking. I hope thank you. you thank share you. my I, I, you share my enthusiasm. Uh, so uh, let me once again. Uh, remind uh, everybody that they can submit their questions through the chat feature and um, I would be happy to uh, read any uh, questions or comments on the on on the, on the material presented by uh, John but uh, um, let me start if I may and give some time to our uh, audience uh, to, to 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 phrase their questions uh, I would uh, like to ask you a couple of things. Um, um, first of all, let me say to everybody that this is really a unique site and the excavation is really unique. Uh, you explained well the idea of, of doing this horizontal work and 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 um, presenting all this uh, material is 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 uh, is something that we uh, uh, have been looking for and it's very difficult to get uh, so especially the idea that we have evidence of this uh, sixth century uh, re uh, utilization refortification of the site by uh, at the time of justinian uh, as uh, mentioned by procopius really gives us an idea of how 
things would have uh, uh, seemed like. But uh, my, I mean, an, an obvious question maybe would uh, be: Did you get? Uh, yeah, did we lose John? Nico, I'm back. But ah, yeah, I, yeah. Okay. So, like, uh, uh, in any case, uh, I skip the question. Okay. <laughs> but did you, did you, did you happen to find any evidence from the final collapse or the final um, destruction, if any, yes. Of, yes. Of, of of the fortress? Yes, we did, and we have actually been able to pretty much date it to the early years of Heraclius's reign. Uh, this would kind of fit the bill by, um, you know, the knowledge that Heraclius, once, of course, he had to counter the Persian threat, which was far more imminent and important, decided to strip the few remaining garrisons up in the Danube and therefore transfer them over to the east. So the destruction layers that we find, and this was a massive destruction that took place, seem to be roughly around 612, maybe up to 620. But one thing we know for sure is the fact that after that, everything was abandoned. So it's not only the military one, but even the civilian settlement was completely abandoned. We'd like to hope that people just move to safer places because the alternative, of course, is a far more morbid one. Oh, yes. Let's indeed hope so. <laughs> uh, but uh, let me uh, read out a question. We have yes. a, a yeah. question by, from uh, uh, Despina Yusuf, another of our uh, professors of at CYA and a good colleague and a specialist on, on, on the period. So Despina uh, asks, uh, she would like to thank you for such a fascinating and clear presentation. Thank you, Despina. And ask if there are any mentions in literary sources of the two martyrs found? And if yes, does their portrayal coincide with the archaeological evidence? Actually, yes. And in, dare I say, a striking fashion. So the whole story about Astion and Epictet and Halmiris is mentioned in one specific narrative that talks, it's sorry, two narratives. One is Lactantius and the second one on the manner in which the uh, martyrs were executed. And then on the, um, there's another ecclesiastical source, I cannot remember it right now, which however also uh, tells us about all of the circumstances that led from their original arrest all the way down to their torture and their final execution within the fort. When they conducted the forensic analysis on both the saints, everything actually was fully confirmed. I don't want to again, again, get morbid, but every single torture that these two had to endure before being executed is clearly confirmed by the analysis, all the way down and including the fact that they had their jaws smashed and then the rest of the face was decapitated because in the pictures, you'll see that we have the lower jaws, but the heads, in fact, went away. So the story about how these two martyred led when Constantine is in fact at Halmiris and he hears about them, he is the one that gives the order to build the basilica, build the crypt, and right now bring the remains, most likely from the cemetery, straight into the fort. So dare I say, yes, the evidence is conclusive. The ancient ecclesiastical source that speaks of it, which right now, sorry, my mind is like all over the place, but there is one, and let me just say fully confirmed, 100%. Okay, that's wow. That's really yeah. that's amazing. Um, let's continue, and we have uh, another question by Warren Warren Goodfin, uh, and um, as a follow up to the question of the martyrs, wouldn't the presence of their remains at the site imply a rather sudden emergency abutment of Halmiris? Otherwise, one would expect that the relics would have gone with the population to wherever they re relocated, right? Well, the idea is that the martyrs were executed in two hundred and ninety. So during the time when persecutions by Diocletian and Galerius are still in full effect. So their execution at the time would have not been any particular important event. So they are buried elsewhere. We start with that. And then only with Constantine. And once, of course, Constantine has already constituted the Edict of Religious Toleration in 313, is when, hearing the story, he, in fact, commissions the construction of the basilica and therefore the reinterment of the saints 
So at least this seems to be like the chronological framework in which we can actually work. With regard to, and this is interesting, that's actually a very good question, because with regard to what happens in the seventh century, when like, you know, Halmiris is gone, on top of the area of the Basilica, before we started excavating down, we found a grave that belonged to most likely a Bulgarian or Avar princess. My students jumped the gun, they called her Zina, let's not get into that. So just imagine that there is, or there are, the remains of a woman. She is clearly a warrior because she is being buried with all of her weapons. The COD, the cause of death, was a straight arrowhead in the clavicle. So built on top, which means that already, most likely, the basilica was no longer in use. And equally, the crypt would have been covered. So that's the reason why the remains were there all the way down to the time that our team found it. So yes, we're in, uh, thanks you. Um, any other questions? We are coming close to uh, eight o'clock Greek time. So if there is anything now, it would be the time. Um, let me just, as a final comment, use the, the few last seconds to 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 really um, I, I I want you know to to underline the importance of such projects uh, and the fact uh, that uh, you and your team uh, have been working in in Romania uh, for that time for for at least for many reasons, but I would like to, to state too uh, the, the importance of working on these late sites of doing Roman archaeology or early Byzantine archaeology at site. They, the, these kind of sites, they, they are full of, of things, uh, evidence that can help us better understand, but also uh, of the importance of having projects uh, conducted by Greek archaeologists uh, abroad, and not only limiting uh, ourselves, let's say, uh, to work uh, yeah. only uh, yeah. inside the the, the 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 borders of Greece. And I think what you what you presented uh, tonight um, uh, actually uh, offers uh, offers us the, all the merits of of, of of such a project. So really, congratulations once thank again. You. Thank, thank you, Nico. Well, thank you. It means a okay. lot, especially coming from you. <laughs> so. Uh, if uh, since we don't have any other questions and um, we are uh, at uh, the moment that we should be closing, I would like to thank uh, one. Uh, so we have by Whitnap uh, uh, excellent program. Regret having to drop off before the end. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> Thank you for I being. would like to thank you all once again for being here. Thank you all for your questions, especially thank John for this informative uh, session, you. for his lecture. Uh, and um, uh, I would like uh, to welcome you to our next uh, uh, meetings uh, when these will be announced. Uh, and uh, in uh, this way, uh, come our uh, nice evening or morning if you're uh, on the other side of the Atlantic to uh, an end. Uh, so uh, thanks uh, everybody for attending. Thank and, you. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Hope you all found uh, this night quite interesting and informing as, as I did. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you.